Yeah, so um, welcome everyone. I can see that you are coming online. Just give me a little moment or two to arrive. So my name is Claire and I'm joining you today from my cottage on the Otago Peninsula, which is on the South Island of New Zealand. A very warm welcome to all of you on behalf of the 2025 Initiatives Coordination Group. On the 29th of June, transcribed to my notebook a paragraph that Bio Okamanafe had posted to his Facebook page. It wasn't the first time that I had done this, but this paragraph felt to me like an invitation, and I want to share it with you because um, it's a piece that I return to and will return to often. What he said was this. Oh, Clara, I apologize. You sound a little bit faint, so maybe you can... Uh, the, the sound of fire a little bit lower. It's overtaking your sound. I might just turn it off right there. Go, how's that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you. Thanks, Sasha. So, what Bayo wrote was this He said, Don't be so careful. Don't be so calculating about where you place your feet. Don't be so logical. The beckoning horizons do not dip into a merciless abyss from which nothing can be salvaged. You will not fall if you reach the abominable edges where the ground stops abruptly. You will fly. Yes, there's much more room than our fondest ideologies and contrived evidences could possibly apprehend. Dance, he said with a sensuous decadence that comes with knowing you are larger than your containing spaces. That your most outrageous obsessions and drunken fantasies are just as inconsequential as the most popular fads and the most accurate heavens. I love that. And in the heat of your glorious performance, toss away those inter interrupting preoccupations with outcomes, with how you appear in the eyes of public scrutiny, or how well you are doing. For you are not a crease in the fabric of things. You are the fabric of things, exploring the intense and forlorn beauty of a crease. Life is a dance, and dancing wasn't invented for destinations. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Bio. Such a beautiful piece. It, um, yeah, it really opens and opens into many worlds. And today um, we are expanding into a new series or format um, as, a, as a group. It's a, a, we, we're calling them creative labs, these new gatherings. They're spaces in which storytelling is the current or current currency of exchange. And it's my very deep pleasure today to welcome Bayo Komalafe to our circle. Bayo will no doubt be familiar to many of you. He's joining us today from Chennai, India, where he lives with his wife, Ayoma. I hope I've pronounced her name correctly, Bayo. And their two children, Alethea and Kaya. So in your part of the world, Bayo, it's 10 p.m. <laughs> I wanted to just say how I really love the way you close your emails with your name and then you follow it with this beautiful line that says, every night I sing Alethea and Kaya to sleep and hug Lali to wake, I made in these hours. I found that so moving. So I trust that you and your family have had unhurried time to tell your bedtime stories and tuck your two children peacefully into their beds tonight so that you can join us. We really appreciate you being with us. Yeah. Well, well, the, the tucking away didn't quite work this night because they were all jumping on the couches and stuff. So I had to sneak away to, to do this. Um, so everything doesn't end poetically. Um, some nights it ends with um, with a with a rush of adrenaline. So, <laughs> um, well, I'm glad to be here. And you are speaking in, from New Zealand words, 4:30 a.m. in the morning. I really appreciate that. I am. It's a 
wonderful time to be up actually i really i love this pre-dawn time in the dark where we yeah, yeah. just everything feels quiet yeah so i want to just introduce you a little bit about your background bio if i may um let's just say that in addition to you being a husband and a father you are also a psychologist and a professor with an extensive teaching background and much respected as a public speaker um, I have experienced you as an amazing and mesmerizing storyteller, and I, I know that you're a prolific writer. Um, I'm always astounded at how much you write and, and post to social media and how generous you are with your, um, your teachings and your stories. And um, yeah, I, so you, you really do push the boundaries of the conventional <laughs> and also the unconventional in, in ways that open us to um, entirely new ways of and uh, reconfiguring our inner and outer worlds, which is um, a real gift. So, yeah, I have to say that preparing for today was um, a process of trust and, and surrender both because we sort of agreed that we would just do this free form conversation and see where the wind blew us, essentially, in terms of what comes up and what engages us um, to talk about. And um, yeah, having said that, I have a Virgo moon. <laughs> Which means that I um, <laughs> I need a bit of structure. So with all my readings, I did take notes and make jottings and write down a few questions if we need them. You know, trusting fully that if we reach any of those abominable edges that you write about, we will find that we can fly. <laughs> um, so yeah, just to give everyone a little bit of a background to the form of what we're going to do today. Um, we're going to have about an hour, well, between an hour and an hour and a half together. Um, Bio and I will begin with um, a two-way conversation and then at the end of the time, possibly half an hour or so, um, towards the end of our gathering, we'll have time for questions and interaction from the wider group. Um, before we begin, oh, and Alexander, you'll keep an eye on the clock for us, won't you? <laughs> that would be helpful, thanks, so we don't have to think about it. Um, before we begin, it would be great if everyone could switch their microphones onto mute, but we would invite you to activate your cameras so that we can see each other. Um, in a way, this is like gathering around the virtual campfire and it's helpful to see each other. It enhances that atmosphere and it also fortifies our field of connection. So. We'll take a moment now to light candles for those of us who have, have a candle to light. And if you don't have one, it matters not because candles that are lit by the one are lit for the many. And then we'll sit together in silence for just a moment or two um, in welcome of Bio and in support of him and whatever wants to come through him to us during our time together this morning, this evening, this afternoon. And also as a way of bringing ourselves present to each other and to the group. So you might like to scroll through the video gallery just to see who's here and meet each other quietly through the eyes. It can be a meaningful way to establish connection. And imagine um, as you do this that the fires of inspiration are being lit in the space between us. And that the candle flames that we are burning are being passed from person to person and place to place. And as they do, we transcend all the limitations of time and space and geography to link in this one shared and sacred moment.
Thank you, Bio. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. Um, Bio, to get us going, I wondered as a place to start um, with a. I, I'm just thinking back to something that you say. You say that in uh, your in in your Yoruba culture, conversation is um, considered a call and answer expression. Yeah, and I just really love that, you know. And I, and I I if there's a place if you could say about where you come from and and your childhood growing up in Lagos, Nigeria, where, as I understand it, you were um, separated from the language and the traditions of your culture as a, as a child and had to then go back later as an adult and recover um, that aspect of your, of your being and your life there. And I, I imagine that must have been enormously challenging and, and, and confusing for you as a boy. And um, sometimes those aspects of our pasts that we recover and 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 weave into our our beings later become kind of points of enormous growth and and bring gifts that we don't always anticipate um they will i wondered if that's been at all your experience and yeah i yeah. give you the <laughs> um i grew up in uh most of my growing up actually not all of it um in nigeria in West Africa, for those who don't know not where Nigeria is. Um, and uh, I'm part of the Yoruba people. Yoruba people are spread out across, uh, unevenly across West Africa. So not just Nigeria. Um, and yes, to your, your um, what you said about the call and response dynamic, it's this idea that um, the world is a relationship. Right? So no one speaks except you speak within relationship. Um, I guess that's where the idea of a call response dynamic comes from. It's very community oriented. It's not, it doesn't, um, the Yoruba culture tries as, as, as much as it can to steer away from the idea of the individual, um, the, the static individual that is disconnected, dissociated from ecology, from gods, from myth, from responsibility. So, that call and response dynamic is encoded into the way we speak. And I would never have known all of this, you know, as you, as I've shared many times, um, I would never have given it value um, if I didn't start to return in a sense to my culture. So I grew up in a very Christianized world, um, a world that, um, a world that pushed to the underground Yoruba cultures and all other kind of cultures in my country. I think there are about 700 languages in Nigeria. And basically um, with colonization, this, this dualism, this two world theory swept into our contexts and basically said everything that, it, um, everything that is not of our world is inadequate is a failure is is missing superiority in a sense um and i grew up in exile you know thinking about the world in those dimensions um, when my father died when i was i was about 15 i i was in a crisis situation i knew that i had to plant my feet in the ground in a different kind of way um, and so when he died, I started this long quest to find a different sense of home, to find a different sense of fatherhood that was not premised on um, dualism. And I'm still in that decolonial journey, asking questions of my culture, you know, trying to relearn my language. I'm doing a very bad job at doing that. Though. Um, but I'm coming home to myself in ways that are very very um hopefully emancipatory for my children as well um you've written um a book that can you remind me of the title again it's um humanities are uh, these wilds beyond our fences yeah this is to my daughter on humanity's search for home that's a, such a um a beautiful all-encompassing title and what a gift to your daughter to and your son um, to receive um, 
these rich um, what are the mechanisms of of kind of undoing <laughs> and understanding of yeah. where they come from? Um, I, I read something recently which was um, <laughs> is this, this statement that said when you see a crocodile, it's not immediately clear what it is. Is it sorcerer, spirit, or ordinary animal? And and I know that um, in your book. You introduce her to um, the gods of Africa, the, um, the invisible realms, the vital forces, and um, archetypal relationships. Um, Esu or Eshu? Is, is, Eshu. Is, um, Eshu. And yeah. also, Asse is a concept that I am fascinated by, that I, I wondered if you could say something about, about these terms that are, have to do with crossroads, don't they, rather than destinations. Um, okay. So you want me to say something about crossroads, right? And issue. Okay, because I lost you for a moment there, Claire. Um, some glitch in your in the system, I think. Um, system is, is not coming through. Okay, sorry. Yeah, it's, no, um, it's fine. It's fine. You're you're back and clear. Um, so wherever you'd like to with, with this. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, well, crossroads. Uh, let me start by saying I I say this all the time. The times are urgent. Let us slow down. Um, and when people hear that, they think I'm telling them to take a break, you know, to do more yoga often or go on a vacation. It, it, that's not exactly the idea. I've had people write to me and say, um, slowing down isn't exactly working for me because when I try to reduce my speed in the office, um, I only end up doing what I'm supposed to be doing or spending more time doing what I could have done in half the time. And I anger everyone around me. So exactly, what exactly do you mean by slow down in times of urgency? And the idea, the expression of it, the articulation of it invokes the, the notion of the crossroad. That what I mean is not a function of speed. It's not a function of um, reducing one speed. You can reduce your speed on a highway, right? You can slow down on a highway and still be heading in the same direction. That, that isn't exactly transformational or emancipatory. Um, the idea of slowing down here is a function of what I would for conversational purposes call awareness. That it's a function of um, awareness, temporalities. It's a function of the relational notion of the universe. Um, let me put it in a storied format that before I was born in pre-colonial Nigeria, or pre-colonial communities in Nigeria. Um, stories are told about masquerades that would, that would come to crossroads. And the crossroads I described are marketplaces, people, places where beings interact, right? Um, but in Yoruba mythology and cosmology, it's not just human beings that meet at crossroads. It's uh, spirits, it's ancestors, it's monsters. It's things that don't have names yet. Um, things that should not be called, you know, uh, tricksters. They all meet at the crossroads. It's at the crossroads that we gain embodiment. Um, and so Eshu, like you just invoked now, Eshu is the trickster in the Yoruba pantheon. And he is uh, said to be, he defies gender categories. So I'm just speaking for the sake of convenience um, by calling him a he. He's a she and it all at once simultaneously. Um, but he sits, he's, he's said to be the man of the crossroads. That is, he sits with agency, the agency that shapens um, the entire world and the entire universe. He sits with that power at the crossroads. And the idea here is to invite us to notice that the crossroads is where we become bodies, is where I gain identity, is where I lose identity, that we're constantly immersed in crossroads. So this masquerades were always celebrating crossroads. And at crossroads, they would say things that were unsayable. You know, they would speak prophetically. Um, you dare not, you know, speak up to a masquerade. I heard stories from my parents that when a masquerade passes, you don't come out, you know, they would beat you up. They're fierce spirits. You know, I think it's some, somewhat similar to the Halloween culture, even though um, we didn't celebrate that. 
own Halloween was masquerades dancing on the streets, whipping people who they came across, you know, and they would say things and they would dance to music, feverish music. Um, it's from that notion of the masquerade dancing at the crossroads, the crossroads that makes it possible for us to become human, for bodies to become bodies. Um, it's from that idea, that story that I speak, the, um, this concept of slowing down in times of urgency. Slowing down here is a function of meeting at the crossroads, is a function of meeting other bodies and hoping that those bodies meet us well and hoping as well that those bodies shape us in, you know, shape us differently. So the idea here as well, um, part of this idea, the concept is pregnant with a prayer that, you know, in times when we get, we get stuck in performative modes of activism, where we are stuck in this toxic cycle of repeatability, where we're doing our best and nothing seems to be changing. What we need is a crossroads event. What we need is to lose shape so we can gain new shapes. And to, we can do that unilaterally. We can only do that by situating ourselves as close as we can at the crossroads. And at the crossroads, we will be met by things that exceed us, things that will defeat us. And it's only in this humiliation of defeat, it's only in losing boundaries that we gain new shapes. You know, it's only in meeting the obstacle that we become finer species that we become new kinds of bodies. And so the times of urgent let us slow down is not an instruction to anyone to slow down. It's a prayer. It's an invocation. It's a conjuring of the more than human. It's an invitation to entanglement, to shape us differently. That's um, so exquisitely put. It's, it's, uh, when I look at it in the context of, um, of this incredibly busy, chaotic, um, world where everything is pressing in and there's a focus on acceleration and on yep. achievement and on accomplishment, yep. on being seen to be, you know, X, Y, Z. Um, there's, um, I've always had this idea that, um, that we need to be going through the spaces and we need to, which is a, d a different form of crossroads in, and, and also in our, in our, in our living and our working and our being in the world, to, um, the ways of turning up. Um, if the, the more we can lose our attachment to things that are fixed, to yeah. um, uh, to to certain outcomes, to um, even identifiable um, accomplishments, the, the better. You know, I think I think in terms of. Um, it's almost like it, with creative imperatives and, and, and silence. Um, and I, I think of you who's such an amazing wordsmith and so gifted, you know, with, 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 with your, with, as a poet and as, and as a writer. Um, how, how, how do you go about protecting those crossroads spaces? Because everything is pressing in and everything is so full volume, full speed. Um, and to slow down and um, during these urgent times requires as I understand it, a receptivity and, uh, and an availability. And are they the same thing? Is it enough to turn up in the rush of everything and say, I'm available, use me? Or do we need to, um, to kind of structure, impose structures on, on, our, on ourselves and on our, on our um, environments so, so that we can honor and protect these spaces? of turning mm -hmm. up, you know, right. I, I wonder how you deal with that because um, right. I think you're challenged by, you know, that the times are urgent, let us slow down. Right. Um, in a sense, I think the idea of protecting the crossroads is, is a pretty, it's, it's a compassionate notion. Um, in a sense, we want to protect the, the places that we deem are sacred. Um, that we think of as valuable, um, not because they add to our, you know, our acceleration techno-bureaucratic systems, but because they don't, right? And, and because they take us in new directions. Um, and so I understand the sentiment of wanting to do that. And I think there's space for that. I think there's space for resistance. I think there's space for 
locking hands together and saying, you shall not pass, you know, with Gandalfian tones and insisting that monsters will not come through and that we will protect the sanctity of the space. I think there's room for that. But I think there's another powerful sense uh, uh, to the crossroads notion that I'm attuned to and I'm resonating with is the idea that um, the crossroads is not apart from the highway. So I'm just, for the purpose of our conversation, I'm just going to distinguish them. Um, the highway being this acceleration driven um, world that um, flattens everything, that wants to index, categorize bodies, um, that does not know how to relate with the world except to tame it, to put it in a family way, to convert it in, into resources, you know, um, that has lost its sense of the sacred. Um, let's call that the highway. Um, I do not think that um, the highway is apart from the crossroads. Like there are two things. Let's go for the crossroads and abandon the highway. I think that the highway is what the crossroads is doing as well. That separation, you know, the thing that many uh, theorists might call dissociation, the metabolic rift between us and the planet, um, or separation, simpler. Um, the thing that we call separation is what entanglement is doing as well. It's one of its many forms. Um, it's not a thing apart. Um, I, I like to say that if you walk down a highway long enough, you might happen upon, uh, if you think you're going forward, you might happen upon a crossroads and realize you haven't been going forward at all. And I think that's true about modern history, um, that there was a time when, in, during the Enlightenment, um, uh, Euro-America believed it was walking forwards, you know, it was going forward, rationally speaking, into a singularity, into greater uh, transcendence, into greater mastery of the universe or of the elements. And now we're in the Anthropocene, you know, curiously called the Anthropocene, the age of man. And there is no forward movement anymore. It's, it's as if we've suddenly, we now have to reckon with the fact that our so-called progress has been a ruse. We were burning uh, fossil fuels. We were destroying our ecologies and convincing ourselves and our children that we're doing exactly the only thing that is rational, reasonable and right to do. Um, and now we are, we, the, the, we're, we're meeting the insurgency of the costs that we've externalized historically, the monstrous insurgency of the forgotten middle. Um, so forward movement is no longer possible. And now the crossroads um, in its stark majesty now demands different actions from us. Um, and I think that notion of the crossroad does not need to be protected. Um, I, think, I, think, I think we, um, having come here, having, you know, having to see ourselves here, um, now have to genuflect, now have to find ways to meet this being in front of us. You know, whether it's the, a pandemic that requires us to give uh, uh, what the authorities will call social distancing spaces, you know, six feet, maybe that six feet is, a, is the size of the monster that has suddenly descended because we forgot how to give libations and we forgot how to name names and we forgot how to offer rites of passage and rituals. So this is, for me, um, not a notion that needs to be protected. Um, and it's not something we can unilaterally um, construct structures on. I think there is a place of humility where we can um, sit with the trouble is what Donna Haraway, a, bi a biologist, would call it. Sit with the trouble. We're sitting with the trouble. Is there room for us to perform post activisms where we can reckon with our loss, just touch the fabric of our humility, if you will, and prepare the ground, if you will, for us to have exquisite new visions, new kinds of longings, new kinds of wantings that may not look like solutions at all but are maybe the conditions for new kinds of solutions. Are there spaces for that? I think so. It brings to mind the term that you introduced me to some years ago, the Inuit term, uh, Quatsiluni. Is that how you say it? Quatsiluni, yes. Which means um, 
sitting together in the dark waiting yes. for the news for something to happen yeah, yeah. um and we're, we're not so good at sitting quietly in the dark together are we and that's yeah. something that um that yeah that that is really in need of nurture as you yeah. say rituals and, and and libations can you say a little bit more about libations it's <clears throat> That's not so familiar to many of us. Yeah. I, I grew up watching my father and his friends pour wine to the ground, and I would wonder to myself, what a perfectly good waste of wine. Why would they do this? And my father would say things like, it's for the gods, it's for the fathers, it's for our mothers, it's for the ancestors. Even though he was a Christian, there was still that practice of honoring um, the land, if you will. Um, maybe they did it in jest, but I at least watched them do this. And then moving out of my family, taking on a life of my own, um, going into the academic world, I would watch professors do it, you know, radical professors pour wine to the ground when such gestures were becoming unpopular. Um, and then I learned a story about the libation, you know, and I don't want to go through all of it because of time. But it has to do with God's returning to the earth or, um, and deciding to destroy all of mankind, um, everyone on earth, because um, they, um, we had made fun of the chief god, Ra. So this story comes from ancient Kemet, which is the old name for Egypt. And the idea is um, we made fun of Ra. So Ra uh, threw a tantrum. We treat her to heaven, sent his daughter, who also happened to be his wife, who also happened to be his mother. Don't ask me how all of this is possible. Sent uh, this goddess, Hathor, to destroy all of mankind, all men, women, and children. And Hathor comes and she does her work very well. So well that Ra becomes concerned and tries to call Hathor off. But Hathor cannot be uh, called off and... She eats people in this cannibalistic rage every morning and leaves um, and, and drinks up their blood, the puddles of blood, and then comes back to do the same thing every morning. And nothing, no prayers are answered. All the gods don't know what to do. Um, and then Ra comes down again to earth and communes with um, people. And they decide to trick Hathor, basically. And the trick is they would pour red wine on the land, you know, in puddles everywhere. And the, uh, the, the hope is that they would trick Hathor into drinking this red wine, thinking it was blood, and she would forget her directives and be drunk and fall away. And, and so they do it. And it actually works as uh, crazy a plan as it is. It actually works. And Hathor becomes drunk. And so the practice of offering a libation becomes this trickster-driven uh, foundation of remembering, remembering the trick that makes us possible, remembering that we are sustained by this trick, that the world isn't static, that if you get used to your stability, um, if you get used to your sedentary civilizations, if you forget to give a libation, over and over again, then the monster will wake up from her stupor and she will eat us all. And so the libation becomes this programmed ritual of falling down to earth, just like the water falls from the cup or from the gourd, goes to the earth. It becomes this figure of genuflection and humility of coming down to earth, coming off our high horses and falling to the ground um, which we, Yoruba people, um, encoded in our gesture of prostration. When you see an elder, you fall to the ground. And the story behind the prostration is also similar to the Egyptian myth um, that when Shango, the god of uh, fury and lightning and thunder, comes, you don't run away, you don't try to defeat him, um, you genuflect, you prostrate, um, you fall to the ground. So this libation is, I feel, a figure of our times too that um, we're being invited to, to be humble. And I don't mean a feeling of 
uh, being humble, you know, a fleeting feeling of being humble. I mean a cartographical project of practicing demise. Um, and by demise, I mean um, the etymological root of demise is transference of property. That is, things that are supposedly ours, we give to the other. And I mean by demise here that we have historically um, denied the world around us its agency. We have supposed that we are the only ones that are intelligent. We are the only ones that are agentic. We are the only ones that make moves, that think. Um, and now the critical cultural sciences and theories are inviting us to think otherwise, that the world is vital and alive, you know, beyond the human. And I think this mixes with this Kemetian myth of libation and this Yoruba story of the libation and prostration, that maybe it's time for us to learn how to die well and unlearn our mastery. Maybe that is the heart of this anthropocene, scene, not about finding a solution or fixing it with a quick uh, billion dollar project, um, but it's about learning our place uh, and not in an original picture, not, not in terms of returning to an original notion. Um, we're always at the edge of remaking the world and reality. So it's about thinking anew, but thinking with these ideas, these concepts that we are and have never been human in a final sense. We are entangled with the world. We're interconnected with the things that we think are lowly, you know, just beneath our station. And acknowledging that is the start or the beginning, uh, the, are the soft and poetic beginnings of emancipation. The words that stay, that come through, they're just genu genuflect is such a, a very beautiful word. Um, yeah. It's um, back to where we started, which was the notion of us getting right up close to um, what you call the forlorn beauty of the crease. Is that right? Yeah. And um, uh, um, I, so there's so much I want to ask you. Um, in terms of our own day-to-day -day living, like the libations, how, how, how do you, what are the libations as you see them in your own day-to-day -day living? Um, with your family, for instance, um, the, the crossroads that you sit in with, with them and the stories you tell your children. Hmm. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's, there's, so, there's so much I want to ask you. Right. I can answer, I can answer that. Um, I would preface what I'm about to say or share with this cautionary um, statement that none of us are equipped or even invited to master, you know, everything, you know, to get it all, you know, like no one generation will find itself fully um, in possession of it you know, decolonial um, skills or exactly knowing exactly what to do. You know, we're, we're never going to get it fully. Um, we can only meet the world in part. We show up in part ourselves. In an entangled world, there is no final whole. There are only things that are constantly on the move. Even stationary objects are bleeding themselves, you know, um, into the world at large. Um, so having said that, um, one of the modest ways we are, sorry, my screen just changed. So I'm just moving back here. One of the modest ways we are coming to terms with a libation or this invitation ringing through the air that is alive in the atmosphere, um, to fall to the earth is my wife and I, we met, she's Indian, I'm Nigerian. So that explains why I'm a Nigerian living in India. We decided to move here and, and live a small intimate life. Um, but we decided even while we met, you know, that we wanted to unschool our children, our children yet to come. Um, this is not exactly a solution for everyone. This is not a path that everyone needs to take. And I'm learning that the hard way. Um, there is no universal applicability here. Um, but in response to the things we as professors in the university started to notice about the comorbidity, 
of the higher education complex with society, with a capitalist structure, with the ways people, young people especially, are branded failures, you know, and molded according to the, the imperatives and the regimes of nation states. Especially in a country, I think it's even heightened and mostly emphasized in a country like India, which is trying its darndest to be a superpower, to be like America, to be like the, uh, uh, any country in Europe, um, to climb the heights. The people who really suffer this, this, this quest for heights are children. India has the highest suicidal rates among teenagers in the world, last time I checked. And um, it's mostly related to education. So people are really put through the grind. Children are put through the grind to perform, to, to bring forth good grades, you know. But it's also true about India that there are fugitive spaces Prop, uh, you know, sprouting everywhere. And people are questioning this, especially in this time of the coronavirus pandemic. People are now asking questions, now being rendered capable of asking new questions about how we framed education over time. Um, so the way we met this idea of slowing down was to see our children not as passive recipients of our instruction, not as fodder or resources for um, the higher education world, or schooling, factory schooling, public schooling. Um, we decided what if, what if we decided to learn with them as if they were philosophers in their own right? What might happen if we met our children, you know, which in my opinion, um, I think children are some of the um, most excluded and marginalized group of, groups of people in the world today. <laughs> Um, what might it look like to actually be with them, to fall to the earth, you know, not to bring them up to our place of power, but to perform minoritarian um, uh, humility that is coming to their own place of power. Maybe, maybe the call of the Anthropocene is for us to see like children. It's for us to learn how to play like children. Um, that might seem an overly romantic and saccharine statement, but... Um, I, I believe the, the nugget there, the invitation there is until we lose our performance of being human, until we explore this vast territory that we call the human, and until we map out the traumas that we have, that have that signal or mark the spaces that we dissociated ourselves from the world at large, until we learn how to do that, um, we will keep on repeating the toxic situation we're in. And I think one of the ways, one of the portals, one of the wormhole events we have is to meet our children. And, and, and that, that is a very awkward thing to do, I can tell you. But maybe that, that again is the, is, is the thing, sister, that forward movement is not possible. Maybe awkward movement is possible now. Maybe straying away from the algorithms of progress requires us to meet the minoritarian, um, the little, the small, uh, the pathologized, the medicated in new and different ways. I absolutely love what you say about falling to the earth as children. And, you know, our children are the most incredible teachers. Um, um, you know, it's not the other way around that we are their teachers very often. It's, well, it could be mutual, of course, but... Yeah. And, and, and we, we have forgotten how to play. And, and I think that because of our own kind of amnesia about playfulness, we visit that in our children, which robs them of something so vital and essential to um, our being, who we are um, on this world, and absolutely need this capacity to play. And I, I, I love that, that, that you draw attention to that. And yeah, the, that being up close with our children and, you know, what, what bigger gift is there than that? And yeah. they run us through the hoops. <laughs> in the most yes, they do. So, do. Absolutely incredible. It takes us back to the beginning when we were talking about, um, you know, what you were um, denied, if you like, of your own cultural experience as a child, how you've had to recover that and how I, I'm, I'm hearing that that is the gift of that is the way that you are now engaging with your own children. Um, uh, would, would, you, would you say that, um, that 
that you're doing things differently now because of your own childhood experiences so you able to meet your children well um all I knew was school growing up. We had songs because um, the Yoruba people were colonized. Some of them shipped off across the Atlantic. Um, and so, like I said earlier, I grew up in exile. You know, home was already um, an inflected home, the home in the wake of colonial departures. It wasn't the home of my great grandfathers. It was a different kind of home, right? Um, and that was the only world I knew. Um, I wouldn't say that um, recovering a sense of um, groundedness with, within my culture um, or within, you know, or, you know, external to the modern is um, directly related with my childhood experiences. But I would say that there, there are things that um, have been said um, by elders in, in my land and their practices that are, I find genuinely interesting, you know, today, that if we actually really consider that, um, many people might think twice about um, this failure of imagination that is literally the universality of schooling. Again, I do not speak of schooling as a monolith, like, um, there's no such thing as school. Uh, we only have peculiar practices in their specificities in locality. So we have to speak about that to honor that. But speaking is, a, is another form of violence in itself. Uh, what can you do? Um, so I don't mean it, in, I don't mean to speak about schooling in a monolithic sense. And I don't mean to speak about decolonization as unschooling um, in a final way. Um, but in, uh, with some specificity, you know, to our own lives. And I think many people from the global South, many communities from the global South, schooling represents a colonial interruption. And it represents the stability um, and the, the perpetuity of um, a colonial th thinking, of colonial thinking. Um, So there's this story that we tell, for instance, you know, just trying to see how Yoruba cultures speak about um, children and what children actually bring. They don't say that children come into the world. They say they come out of the world, you know, coming already, dragging wisdoms with them. And I find that a really beautiful thing to notice. Um, the first and the last, you know, this cardinal points and nominal positions are, are turned on their heads in Yoruba culture. For instance, when a woman has twins, when a woman has twins, we have names for each twin and the children that come after the twins. So the first child is Taiwo and the second child is Kendi and the third child is Ido. Um, I'm actually an Ido, um, even though I lost my two brothers. Um, my and only came to know that quite recently, um, that I had siblings, twin siblings before me. So I'm actually an Ido. Um, and this, this is how Yoruba people named their children in order. Now the story here, the, 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 the strange story here is, I said Taiwo is the first and Kane Day is the second. But Taiwo is actually really the second child, the, the younger of the twins. In the womb, the, 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 the story, the myth is Kainde sends Taiwo out into the world and says, go and see if the coast is clear for us to come out. The elder one sends the younger one out and says, go and see if it's, the coast is clear. If you cry, then I know it's good to come. And so <laughs> Taiwo comes out and yells and Kainde comes closely, follows closely afterwards. So there's this deeper understanding, maybe lost on highly educated Yoruba people, that um, the one who follows is actually the elder one. And I, I, I think that queers and disturbs the, um, the infrastructure, the superstructure of schooling. The first becoming the last and the last becoming the first. Children coming with their own wisdoms, being worthy of being listened to and not just imposed upon. Those dynamics are very, very, are recoverable. 
And I think not just recoverable in terms of just bringing them off and dusting, off, dusting them off like fossils um, uh, or fossilized wisdoms, um, but staying with them might bring us to new ways of interpreting and dwelling with the challenges of the present. And so what we're doing here, my wife and I, with our two kids, seven and three years old, is we're conducting research projects with them. You know, we're allowing their questions to take us off our tracks. For instance, uh, some time ago, a couple of years ago, my three-year-old daughter asked me this question, and I don't mean to be indelicate. Um, she said, she said um, where does caca come from? Kaka is what we call shit in our household. It's just a baby language that took on and we, everyone calls it kaka. That's what we call it. And she says, where does it come from? Where does it, especially, where does it go to? You know, not just how our, do our bodies produce it, but where does it go to? And that became a research project. We went on the street just outside our, of our house and we started to ask people, um, the man down the street, where do you think our kaka goes to? And they're, they're like, what's happening here? You know, I think those strange, surprising research, um, and I think it's research. It's research. It doesn't need to be credentialized, you know, uh, by, by high and mighty university to be noble, fugitive research. And I think that's the kind of research we need to reorient ourselves in a world that is stranger than we thought it was. And so we are still learning about shit today and um, the nobility of shit. It inspired me to actually write a, write a letter to Trump uh, when Trump called Nigeria, especially and African nations in general, shithole countries. And I wrote a country, I, I wrote, sorry, I wrote a letter. I doubt he read it, but I wrote a letter to Trump and I called it the surprising nobility of shit. And I explained to him the things that we're finding out about shit that is not as bad as you think. And maybe you should do some exploration and some exploration of your own. You might be able to understand your issues better. <laughs> There's a wonderful story about how the best compost for fruit trees and roses is human excrement and sawdust. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And we're, we're moving towards experimental futures, is what one writer said. The future is brown, it's not green. Don't we? The mess of compost and the shit, as you say, it's, um, that's where we have to go. That's the invitation at the moment, isn't it? Um, and there is a nobility there. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. How wonderful. And I, I'm so, I, I would love to talk to you about um, your non-schooling, schooling program with your children or, yeah. you know, just laugh together at some, you know, in, in great depth. But I'm, I'm just aware of the time bio and I'm yeah. thinking to um, open up the conversation to others in the group and see if anyone has a question for you or um alexander is is that about a good time to segue into yes so that that's what i was about to say that's maybe oh. we could, um, okay, so, open up um, the conversation the of that because um it requires raising hands and unmuting etc uh, yeah, it's it's much easier in Zoom, so uh, everyone can just unmute uh, himself. So please, if you uh, would like to share anything and ask, just unmute yourself and step in into the circle around the fire of this conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe I can say, open that. I, I wrote down the phrase that you said, Bias. Uh, speaking is another form of violence. Yeah. What do you actually mean? Because I think it's a very interesting concept. And in some of your talks, you were, I've heard you were uh, saying many things in terms of how the words we use can be divisive. And so it's, uh, it's the whole area of exploration. So what do you mean speaking is another form of violence? Have you heard of the Procrustean bed? I think it's called yes. the Procrustean bed. You've heard yeah, about it from the Greek mythology, bed. yes. From the Greek mythology. And how the, um, the eponymous, you know, highway robber would basically put people that he captured on a bed. And if you fit, you were set free. If you're exactly the right dimensions to the bed, let's say the bed was six feet. If you're six feet tall, you could go. But if you're six foot one, you would cut off the point one. And if you're 
5.3, with this violent contraption, you would stretch your bones to fit the, uh, fit the bed. Um, in a sense, modernity is this arrangement of categories that are supposedly fitting and appropriate to each uh, to one another. Um, speaking in a sense, in, in the epistemology of modernity, is about representing a world that is static, that is an objective visual referent outside of our imaginations. Good speaking or truth telling is about um, approximating as best as we can with our words, with our concepts, with our lives, this externally um, distant world, right? Um, but if we take it for granted that the world is not actually outside of us, that we are performing the world, that to know the world is to make interventions in the world, is to make marks upon the world, that knowing is a form of navigating through the world, not a sitting apart from the world and trying to view it uh, with some exterior posture. If we take that for granted, um, then the world is constantly moving. There is no objectively stable referent point. It's constantly moving. So the moment we speak, we're cutting something out. Um, we're leaving something behind. And it's necessary. You know, language is also speciated. It's not according to the Enlightenment um, uh, assumption underline everything. It's not a description of everything. There are some places um, that language cannot go. And that is, again, a restoration of this notion of the sacred. There are some things that will not be spoken or rendered or translated into words, right? So if language is just an aspect of a world that exceeds it, then speaking, trying to speak the world or contain it with my words, even with the idea of entanglement, is to leave something out. When I say capitalism, I've left something vital about capitalism out that might be there for the scene. I think it's best described by what Indians here say. I, a proverb I learned years ago that um, name the color blinds the eye. Like, <laughs> name the color blinds the eye. The moment you name the color, you've left many aspects of its hue, of its saturation of its chromatic you know, um, configuration. You've left all of these things out. And now we're stuck in names. Now we're stuck in identities. Now we're stuck in subjecthood. So this is what I mean by speaking is a form of violence. I don't mean is a form of violence, so let's get rid of it. I mean that in a world that is entangling and entangled, we probably cannot get rid of violent aspects of being in it, right? So... Um, that's what I mean there, so I think. Does it mean then speaking in parables, uh, speaking to, like, like telling stories is the softer way to represent the truth? No, I, I don't, no, I don't even, I don't think, um, oh, that's a heavy one. Um, let me back up a bit. I don't think that there is a truth to represent with our words. I think the speaking of it, that in just in speaking, I am materializing the world. It's just like what um, theoretical physicists, uh, you know, and experimental physicists discover with dual slit experiments, uh, you know, that it's even the observation is part of the materiality of the thing we're observing, mm -hmm. right? So there isn't, it's, it's, Alexander is like trying to surprise your mirror, uh, a, a, re, a reflection of yourself in the mirror. It's like trying to say, boo and be shocked by the reflection. Um, the world is not apart from our speaking. You know, so there isn't, the representational dynamic is dualistic. What do I need to say to capture the world? Is it story? Is it words? Is it concepts? Is it formulaic? Is it mathematical concepts? Do they describe a world that is outside? We do not notice that in measuring the world, the, the world is measured into being. You know, the measurement, length, uh, truth do not exist prior to our measurements, the measurements that we impose or that we apply or that we perform. So even stories enact a form of violence. Even stories cut away things from being noticed. There isn't a solution to this. There isn't an app to solve this. And it's not even a problem, you know. It's just noticing that in a world that is entangled, we can only show up in part. 
we can't show up fully. There is a virtual aspect of ourselves that is constantly fading away. And there is the one that we notice that is given priority through our language when we speak. That is the world that we navigate daily. But there is a world that is molecular. I think the French philosopher Deleuze called it the molecular, you know, uh, apart from the molar. The molar is what we see. Alexander is this human being sitting with headphones in Brooklyn. Brooklyn, right? Brooklyn? Yep. And sitting on the chair. See, I'm psychic. I knew you were in Brooklyn. No, he told me before. <laughs> I, I'm just, um, you're sitting in Brooklyn. But there are other aspects of Alexander that escape our, the sensitivity of our tools of measurement. And it's constantly fading away. So you're always to be seen in part. You're not complete. Like the name of the Indian goddess, Alec, um, not Alexander. Oh, I forget. I forget the name. Oh, I forget the name. But it means never not broken. Never not broken. Uh, I remember Akilandesh Vari. Yeah, that's the name. Akilandesh Vari. Never not broken. We are always flowing and moving like a river, and becoming other than what we are. So, Bio, would you say, what would you say about silence as a mode of speech? Hmm. I think silence is replete with worlds. Uh, silence is not nothing. Um, the silence is not empty. You know, even the vacuum is teeming with quantum life, you know, performing, experimenting with the edges of reality. Um, so silence is, is not a place that is neutral. I don't think silence is even apolitical or ahistorical. I think silence is a, is a form of speaking in itself. But maybe it's a form of speaking that, that undercuts popular forms of speaking. And maybe that's why it's so popular, um, uh, especially across spiritual traditions today, that maybe there's a form of speaking that we can adopt that um, helps us retire our words, our need to impress each other just for a little while, and to put that aside. And maybe in speaking this way, with the synonyms, the exquisiteness of silence, maybe in speaking with silence, we are able to see in the way that it allows us to see that words may not be able to. Um, so I think silence is a form of speaking. It's a very eloquent form of speaking. Um, that is a speaking with others. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Is there anyone else out there who would like to ask a question or offer a thought? Yes. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated with, um, hi, Bio. I'm fascinated Hello. with um, a number of, of your, your thoughts forward movement is no longer possible in right. this time that we're in yes. um, and and in losing our boundaries we gain shape yes and and being comfortable at this period of time where we are as a collective with discomfort <laughs> okay, okay? Yeah. Um, I, 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 I love all of that because it, it, it really speaks to um, the sense of pause, hmm. right? It's mm -hmm. pause. So, um, and, and the one thing that as a collective, we find so much resistance happening yeah. to, you know, or about, you know, one wants to pause. Um, and yet the feeling is that the pause will be no matter what. It mm -hmm. is we want. Mm -hmm. It's not about what we want at yeah. this period of time. The pause is going to be. Um, so this whole idea of forward movement is no longer possible. That one, that one is 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 it is, is really striking me because there is um, in my in in there's an inner quest to. To, 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 to be of service to humanity right now. Right, okay? right. And, and in that inner quest, a certain amount of forward movement is necessary. 
Mm. You know what I mean? Uh, this mm. this feeling of, and and at the same time, there's this feeling a re a, not a, there's an observation that that no matter what what forward steps we're trying to take, many yeah. are yeah. trying to take, we're being blocked. Mm-hmm. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. Um, so I just wanted you to speak to that a little bit more. Hmm. Thank you so much. That was uh, hearing that back was very useful and and um, beautiful. Um, so I I would invite us to examine the discourses that shape our notions of forward movement and progress, and most especially humanity. Um. These things are not naturally occurring, self-evident concepts. Um, they are constructs, and they have shadows, and they have, like the Procrustean bed, things that they occlude, you know, or push aside, so that we're not able to notice other things. You know, the world works in those exclusionary ways. Um, the concept of forward movement, I think, is. Um, I, I wonder if she, if you're still there. I think she's frozen. Shall I go ahead? Uh, yes. Yeah, we can okay. hear you by your. Okay. Oh, all right. You froze for a bit. I'm here. I'm here. Okay. Okay. Um, the pause um, was on your screen for for, for a while, so I wanted to uh, <laughs> honor the pause. <laughs> um, that I feel that the the notion of forward movement has history. Um, First is it's tethered to militaristic time. Yes. Um, that time flows from the past in the pres- to the present and to the future. Um, and I call it militaristic time. Karen Barad calls it empty homogeneous time because it basically, it basically treats every situation as the same, every context as the same. This, is, this militaristic time is what made clocks and time zones and airplanes and our basically our globalizing economy possible. Um, It's this universalizing principle that time is the same everywhere. Time is not thick in Nigeria. It's flat everywhere. Um, That's what makes imperialism possible. So you can, you can already taste the toxicity there that it's, there's something dangerous about that idea that time is similar. Because if I say time is empty, the same everywhere, then I can basically come to you and say you're out of time. I can come to your lands and say you're backward. And it's my work to bring you up to speed. So I'm going to teach your children. I'm going to deny basically your own histories. I'm going to look at that mountain and laugh in your face when you tell me that mountain is sacred. And I'm going to flatten it and install a parking lot this gentrification is, um, needs empty time, forward movement to be possible. So you can see how these concepts are stitched into each other, forming an embroidery, an embroidered fabric of imperialism. Um, so I grew up knowing myself to be constantly late, and I know that is not unique to me. I know lots of black bodies feel themselves to be late. You're never arriving on time. And so we joked about it and called it African time. We're always late. (laughs) You know, we're we're always trying to catch up. African nations and the so-called global South nations are doing their darndest right now, like India, as I mentioned, to catch up with the West. And this catch up imperative, again, comes from this notion that we are on a Comptian um, spectrum and our work is to rush to the future, to get to the finish line. So when I say forward movement is no longer possible, it means I think we've come to such a crossroad event. And and I'm not even speaking about the coronavirus pandemic, which to me feels like an explosion, Um, like the Second World War, uh, uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki bomb blasts. Um, I feel that in this notion that the human is connected with ecology, that we thought we got away with it. We thought we were, you know, we could just tinker with the world and do anything we want without consequences. Now the consequences have come and knock on our, they've come and they're knocking on our door and we meet them face to face. 
And now we realize we're entangled with these consequences. That already disturbs the idea of humanity. That already queers and unsettles the idea that humanity is a separate prestigious regime of bodies disconnected with this other enlightenment thing that we call nature, right? So there are many ideas here and we can speak to it for months on end. You know, the idea of forward movement is, is disturbed by a crossroads. That is, a crossroads breaks time. The crossroads breaks time. It, it does not permit you to um, uh, insist on your own way. Like you've rightly said, you know, this is not up to us entirely. Um, now we've come to a place where we realize that um, if we continue doing what we've been doing, we will reap, we'll continue to pile on our indebtedness to the world around us. Um, and we're still trying to do it right now, my big sister. We're trying to do it right now with uh, um, this rush back to normalization, to the normal, to the familiar. Let's create a vaccine. And with a vaccine, we can you know, kill the virus, the enemy that is outside of us. You know, I think that is another centralizing of the myth of control. Um, and that even if we found a vaccine, um, that vaccine will come at a cost that will have very material, very strong material consequences for how we frame ourselves and our lands. And we will continue to encroach on forests to continue to build parking lots, and then we'll continue to repeat the cycle, um, increasing the light, uh, probability that we'll, more viruses will find us. So it's a toxic cycle there. I don't know if I've been able to speak to that well enough to, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, for another question? Yes, yes. Okay. Hi, Bio. Thank you for Hi, your, Jamie. your presence. Um, many indigenous and traditional cultures speak to plant spirit medicines and animal spirit uh -huh. medicines and rock spirit medicines and so on. From your perspective, what is human spirit medicine and how do we honor and carry that at this time? Hmm. I don't know how to think of things it's it's definitely not my forte um i don't know how to think of things as essentialized um uh and sold things you know that are disconnected with everything else i'm mad you see i'm i'm i've been maddened by not just my culture but my own training and my own decolonial journey um and so i i cannot help but notice that plants are already part of humans mm -hmm. and that humans are already bacterial and microbial and and um i don't need a microscope to even feel that you know um that in our guts for instance in our bellies there are microbial activisms that actually generate intergenerational um, trauma or teach us how to remember things or actually tinker with how we want and how we feel um so that we are always an assemblage. You know, we are always a constellation of other things. Um, we are never the one thing. That reductionistic notion is, doesn't sit well with me, even though I understand it's the need and I, and I think I understand what it's doing. Um, but I feel we're a constellation. And so to speak to a plant spirit, again, maybe the language there does us in. And we think to ourselves that maybe there is some kind of, um, we take it literally, you know, and literalism is another, you know, egoic uh, um, feature of modernity. I don't know if you know of James Hillman. Uh, very, very, James. very well. Let me rephrase yes. it. Maybe that will help with the intent. Okay, okay, okay. So from, from the perspective in which I offer the question, it would be that a certain plant species, uh, animal species, uh, certain kinds of rocks, all have a gifting to the whole, right? Just yes. as you're speaking to, they all have a gifting to the whole. So my question from your perspective is, what is humans' unique gifting to the whole 
that right. if we don't fully step into it and we don't fully give our gifts, that is missing from the whole. Hmm. You know, do you, does it make sense more that way? It does. It does. It does. Well, on one, let me hold one hand up and say I would, I would echo the sentiments of the famous comedian George Carlin um, and say maybe our gift to the whole is plastic. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe the world just spawned us because it wanted to know what plastic looks like. Um, and I don't think uh, I would even take that comically. I think there's something serious about that to be considered as well. But from another perspective, I would, I would say stability. Um, that the human is caught up in the human, the project of the human. And I don't think of the human as a figure within uh, the bipedal figure. I think of the human as a territory, right? A way of performing being in place or being out of place, a way of performing a relationship with other species. That's what I feel the human is. Um, so the human is processual. And I think the gift of this process has been a, stabil a stabilization of, uh, of, of the world, uh, a making place, a making of homeliness or a making of home that, um, that gives birth to concepts of futurity or permanence. And I think that's what uh, entanglement is also exploring as well. So um, other than that, I do not know that I can speak to what the humans are bringing to, what humans are bringing to the table, other than the things that I already see are, are emerging from our practices on the planet. That is, modernity is a paradigm of the human and we are producing stabilized civili uh, civilizations notions of progress, uh, notions of permanence. We created heavens. Um, and, and I wonder what the post-human looks like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe I would say that. It reminds me of something you said, Bio, which was, um, we need an edge of departure that heeds an invitation to come down beneath the surface, to wade uh -huh. in. Yeah. Can you take us even more deeply into these waters? <laughs> you know, Harriet Tubman and her um, wade in the water, the Negro spirituals, you know, wade in the water, um, as I learned is, um, again, if you take that literally, um, it wasn't just singing a song, it was actually fugitive instructions to those who would leave the plantation. That is, to evade the dogs that have been set on your tail, literally go into the water, wade in the water. So there, there was something always excessive about those um, invitations, something, odd, something else that wanted to be heard. Um, I think this edge of departure that I speak of is, um, let me put it this way. I feel that the coronavirus pandemic is, a, is an accusation of the flesh. What do I mean, an accusation of the flesh? I mean, it's not just infecting bodies. That's one way to see it. I think it's, it's um, undercutting the anthropos, the giant human figure that stands on the, on the world as master of the world. And how, why do I say that? Um, again, the questions we're asking today are very, very criminal questions. You know, I don't know what, where, oh, you're in New Zealand. I don't know New Zealand um, well enough to speak about it. But I know in a place like India, the authorities are worried that people are beginning to consider uh, a world beyond schooling. Or that people are beginning to consider because of the world that follows the world beyond schooling is a world beyond consumerism. Because now I would have the time to create with my daughter. Industry, uh, in the ways we framed it, will not be the center of production. Um, it would be democratic, it would be diffracted among us, it would be ordinary and everyday. Um, and I think the authorities are scared of that. And so they want us to get back to work, if you will, get back to your cubicle keep producing, keep the rat race going. The coronavirus pandemic seems to be the 
catalyst that makes us see all these questions, like a crystal in a supersaturated solution. So the human now comes to be. We, we now, we're able to trace out its boundaries. We're able to say, this is why we behave in the ways we do. This is why we continue to destroy uh, forests and ecological systems and stack animals one upon the other. This is why we do all these things. Um, so along with other voices, I am calling for fugitive departure. Not a leaving behind in a static, intact, pure way, but practices that allow us to go under the, uh, to the underworld. Um, I can speak about this for a long time. I, I don't think there's enough time, but some authors call it catabasis, or going to the underworld, where we might be stitched again and again. I call it making sanctuary. And making sanctuary is the edge of departure um, that I feel we need to start erecting. Um, because to tell you the truth, I, I don't think the human, um, I don't think the human, which, which is already a racialized concept, uh, because of course, many, many people were not allowed access into that category historically of the human. They were not quite humans. They were not yet humans. I don't think the human is working and the Anthropocene is really the ground, the flag point around which we gather to say, maybe this form we've taken, maybe the concepts and the philosophies and the ideologies that create this notion of the human as the master, as the, uh, as the, the one with suzerainty, the one that is transcendent, maybe it is very problematic. And maybe we need to take on new shapes. Um, what that looks like, I don't know. Um, all I know is that there is a place of waiting and there is a place of dancing and there's a place of masquerading and there's a place of sitting with the trouble and there's a place of praying for the rain to pour after we bury the seed in the ground. And there's a place of noticing that we will not get everything in, done in one generation or in multiple, several generations. There's a place of noticing that failure is good that my failure might be the composting ground for others to build upon, you know, and my failure is needed to contribute to the world that is constantly becoming. And when we gather in these fugitive spaces outside the plantation of the familiar, then we might be able to notice wiser economies, wiser ways of framing education. Notice I say wiser, not the wisest. You know, the world is constantly open-ended. I don't think they're the wisest, uh, you know, which is the reason why I'm, I'm afraid of heaven, you know, why I'm re a recovering Christian, because heaven is too final for me. Um, it's too, it ends, you know. I cannot imagine myself just waking up every eternal morning to sing or to float on a cloud, you know, that, that, that's scary to me. Um, so this open-ended world, I think, called for us to change shape, to to become different, to, to ask new questions, to notice that the answers are not always already available and, and to stay with a teenage universe that is also discovering itself, you know, also wondering about itself, also asking itself questions. You know. um, so this is what I call fugitivity. And this is what I call edges of departure into liminal spaces. You know, so it's like um, occupying a big roomy container that's uh, comprised of paradox and porosity and, um, and possibility. Which we already are in right now. It's just, we're in, we're in those rooms right now, sister. It's just that our habitual modes of perception do not allow us to acknowledge that. Um, it's a huge yeah. unlearning process. Yeah. Yes, it's on. It's 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 an unlearning journey that will take into that will take many generations, and then there will be new lessons when that generation thinks it it has it all together. <laughs> I loved what you said. You said um, somewhere about future futurity, fugitivity. Fugitivity. Yes. Um, you talked about running, not yeah. not just but, but to run. Um, yes about the destination though is it that's what you keep coming back to it's not about the destination it's about this process yeah, yeah. 
of hierarchies and uh, redrawing something that's braver <laughs> and, yes. and accommodating and welcoming a, a century. Yes. I mean, destinations are good, right? I would like to know where I'm traveling to if I'm on a plane. I wouldn't like the pilot to announce to me if planes become possible again that we're just going to fly for, for a bit and see where we land. <laughs> I wouldn't like that to happen. So I'm not dismissing destinations or solutions or resolutions. Um, I am, however, pointing out that how we think about the future is an instigation of the present. Um, we imagine ourselves, you know, that's the liberal humanistic myth that we are, we are free and we can unilaterally imagine a world that we want to live in. And so all we need to do is just with political will, bring the resources together, form a manifesto, create a blueprint, and presto, we're in the new world we want. You know, that, that idea of agency is very anthropocentric. I think imagination is ecological. Cognition, thinking is shared, not just with human minds, but with trees, and which is the reason why uh, James Hillman would say the mind is in the psyche, not the psyche in the mind, you know. We are in the world. The world is doing the thinking, not us, you know, so to speak. Um, so running to me, you know, uh, is, is the space of holding at bay our anxious, the feelings of urgency, you know, that inspire us to create destinations, solutions. Um, and as a recipient of Western benevolence, <laughs> you know, I know in my bones that good intentions can have disastrous consequences. You know, it's not about how good you are or how righteous you are or how well you compost or divide your refuse, you know. And that's another thing, you know, um, that I like to point out, that even when people in the so-called West, you know, divide their trash, you know, meticulously, what they're not told most of the time is that some of these things are not recycled. They're shipped out to Ghana or Sierra Leone or Nigeria, and they become the playground that people like me grow up playing upon, you know. So this subsidized realities are now, this is why I say future thinking or forward movement is not possible anymore because now we stacked us so much debt that the debt has crawled back and we're meeting it in the face. And it's like, you have to deal with me, brother. You have to stay with me, sister. Um, you can't just march on into your fantasy of, uh, of utopia. So running means we find space for us to be silent, sister, to be silent about uh, or to hold back our needs to impose a future. Maybe in the running, we'll know how to speak about destinations in ways that are shocking to us now. Maybe in running, there are new imperatives that might come to us other than, where's the map? Where's the map? You know, as fugitives who escaped from plantations and made their way to the Great Dismal Swamp, which is what was a place of marinage, a place of a, a fugitive community between North Virginia and Car North Carolina and Virginia. Um, it's dwindling now because of development. But the Great Dismal Swamp, that's its name. People would escape there, um, those that didn't go uh, to Harriet Tubman. Um, and um, they, they didn't have GPS. They didn't find their ways there with GPS. They found their ways there with rumors you know, with noticing where the sun lands and where the moss grows on the, on the tree, knowing that the moss grows on this side of the tree, that must be north. You know, they had to interact and have conversations with ecology to find their way, to know how to speak about destinations. And I think that's what we need to have. We've unilaterally created destinations. And I think maybe we need to sit with others in community right now, not just human others, but even with our furniture even with bacteria. We need weird politics that allows us to do that. And then we can now start speaking about destinations. Weird politics, I love that. And weird politics, a, yes. A process of recovery, recovering, isn't it, that we're in? Um, yes. Connection with so much. 
um, yeah. that valuable. Yeah. 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 Recovery, is, is, yeah. Is, is there anyone else um, who would like to speak? I'm aware we're at the end of our time together, so I just want to give make sure that if anyone has a hand up that we see it. Um, <laughs> and that there's an opportunity for you to speak. I've noticed a couple people just joined us and today we meeting in an unusual time uh, because uh, our guest Bayer is in India now and it's very late at night for him. And so, uh, but this uh, sharing, this gathering around the fire will, is recorded and it will be available to watch online. So we invite you to watch it again and uh, for those of us who's been here uh, please share with your friends back to you Claire um, I'm noticing that there, there are a couple of messages in the chat box um, one is from Maria and Bart Caligari Cook um, who said thank you bio for your general sharing and insights today um, from Michael P, Spherical and Cyclical Time. Thank you. And um, from Lara Ta Barrett, thank you, Bio, for your time and wisdom. And from John, yes, thanks, Bio, and to the panel, most interesting and enlightening. Um. It really has been a gift to spend time in your company today, Bio. Thank you so much for your generous sharing and, and wisdom that, um, you've given Thank us you. much away and um, go forward with or to be with if not forward then to be with so, yeah. Thank you I just want to pay homage to Heather's uh, cat which <laughs> which I felt was a snake when because of the very beautiful tail and I almost jumped but yeah it's a beautiful cat so Heather's cat hello <laughs> Well, thank you all for having me. Thank you, Claire and Alexander. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bayo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope we it's not the last time we're coming together around the fires. So please join us again, Bayo. I'm sure I will. I'm sure I will. Thank you so much. Bye. Well into your night. Yeah. And others into the day, <laughs> wherever you are in the world. Thank you for being with us. Bye. Bye. Take care. Blessings. <laughs>